Hey guys, welcome back to Bumble TV. Guys, we're going to be reacting to Jonathan Peterson Educate Che Morgan, Idre Hamas for. Guys, I I mean no disrespect in this video and this is just for educational purposes. Guys, let's get straight into this. Well, I'm joined now by Dr. Jordan Peterson. Uh, Jordan, great to have you back on the program. A lot has happened since you were last on just a few weeks ago. Uh, I want to start by saying that I, I'm wrestling with a lot of moral quandaries about this war. And I'm hoping that through our conversation today, we might get to at least have some clarity about the moral quandaries and see if we can mm -hmm. uh, work out what we should be thinking about this, because I think it's very complicated. Um, and it's got to be nuanced, this conversation. D do you feel any moral quandaries about it? Well, I don't think you can have a war without moral quandary. I mean, a war is the consequence of ah, an unsolvable ah. moral quandary. And so uh. it's not surprising that the conversation surrounding the war is full of moral quandaries, because if, if it was straightforward and simple, and if there was an easy path forward, then there wouldn't be a war. And so, I mean, I'm, I can tell you what I think is going on to the degree that you can reduce it to something quickly explicable. You know, I think Iran is desperate because of the tenuous hold on power that the mullahs now have in Iran, given their own citizens' rebellion. I think they see the Abraham Accords, which were the most significant step forward towards peace in the Middle East for like 75 years. They see the Abraham Accords as an existential threat. This is a last ditch attempt by the Iranian mullahs to use the Islam against Jews story to prop up their own dismal reign. And so they rattled the chain of their Hamas puppets and said, provoke, and they did. And their hope is that the Israeli response will be so overwhelming that the Arab world turns against them, and maybe even the people who might be inclined to you know, be swayed by a victim narrative in the West, and that the Abraham Accords will fall apart, and, and that'll be the end of that. And that could happen, and I'm hoping it won't, because I think the Abraham Accords were, you know, and it, it's irritating to me for whatever you, you know, utility that is, is that I think I know, insofar as you can know such things, that Saudi Arabia would have signed the Abraham Accords two years ago if Biden would have moved a little bit more forthrightly on it. And I think the reason that he didn't and the Democrats didn't was because they didn't want to give Trump any credit for anything that he had attained in his administration. And I think all of that is appalling. And, you know, I see this story of Muslim against Jew being put forward in this propagandistic manner. And I think, well, the Muslim world has to make a choice too, because it doesn't look to me like their proper champions are, is the government in Iran, you know, and, 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 and it's not like the Saudis don't have their flaws and perhaps the rest of the Arab governmental structures, but the, the Islam world should move in the direction of the Abraham Accords. That would be great for everyone. We could have a real peace. We could have something approximating a union of the Abrahamic people. And I think the accord was named extraordinarily well. Or we could have what we've had for the last 75 years with the Palestinians as perpetual cannon fodder, you know, at the beck and call of those for whom having them be cannon fodder is useful. And so, yeah, well, there's just moral quandaries everywhere there. It's a minefield, but that's what I think is the, the fundamental reality of the current situation. It's a propaganda war, and there's a lot at stake. On October the 7th, Hamas obviously committed a, a terror attack of appalling magnitude. Where were you when you first heard about it, and what was your instant feeling about it? Well, my instant feeling was to be sickened by it, you know, and it hasn't been that long since I was in Jerusalem, and so it was a little closer to me than it might have otherwise been. Um, I'm also more sensitive to any signs of anti-Semitic catastrophe from studying the Holocaust for the length of time that I did. And I've always regarded Jews as the canary in the coal mine. And I think the reason that the Jews are the canary in the coal mine is because they're a successful minority. 
You know, and if a, if a culture can tolerate a successful minority, it's pretty damn robust and it's not very resentful. And as soon as a culture starts to get resentful, the Jews make an easy target because they're a minority, and so well, that's an easy target to begin with, but then they're the minority that has the temerity to be successful. And that really brings the resentful out of the rat holes. And I've seen a rise in anti-Semitism online over the last three years that's just stunning to behold, on the right and on the left, but jointly. And then, well, so I was sickened by it, but then I was also immediately suspicious of Iran's role. And, I mean, that doesn't require any particular perspicacity on my part. I think it's quite obvious, but, but I, that also opens up the, the rat's nest of, of the maneuvering, the political maneuvering around the Abraham Accords, because, you know, I was very ill when the Abraham Accords were signed, and I couldn't or hadn't paid much attention, and when I sort of recovered my ability to see again, I saw that this remarkable peace process had taken place, and I could not understand for the life of me why it wasn't trumpeted on the front page of every newspaper across the world. And I also think that Trump's team should have got a Nobel Peace Prize for it. I, I cannot see how you could possibly make a counter-argument to that for all of Trump's flaws and for his administration's flaws. This was a major accomplishment. And yet, and I know the Saudis were behind it. You know, they didn't sign it, but it wouldn't have gone forward without their nod and wink. And I know, I believe, that if Biden would have taken the opportunity and been a bit magnanimous in his response to Trump, which he could have been, instead of thinking of him as Satan himself, that he could have enticed the Saudis into a peace accord. And we wouldn't be in this damn situation now. And now we're playing it out the hard way, you know, because the Iranians could win the propaganda war, and they've got, God only knows how many agents they have in the West, you know, promoting the kind of social upheaval that we've seen on the streets in the last few weeks. And so the narrative could go either way, but I'm rooting hard for the, for the Abraham Accords signees, and I hope they have the courage of their convictions, and I hope they can see that their way forward is the most appropriate way forward for the good of the Muslim world. Or what, are we going to stay in some 14th century conflict between the fundamentalist Muslim world and the and the Jews? Jesus, that sounds, you know, we've had enough of that, haven't we? You'd think. I asked Ben Shapiro, what, what is the proportionate response to what happened on October oh, the 7th? Yeah. And he said, there isn't one. That There is yeah. no proportionate response, and there shouldn't be. Uh, I mean, that in itself, you know, I asked Vivek Ramaswamy uh, when I interviewed him at the weekend the same question, and he was basically inferring the same, but he also said that, um, you know, he would happily put the heads of a hundred Hamas leaders on stakes along mm. the border as a message mm. to people uh, not to commit this act. I thought that was a, a sort of medieval barbaric response to med medieval barbarism, and mm. that eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth is not the solution. I also mm. believe that Israel has a fundamental right not just to defend itself after what happened, but has a duty to protect its people, and it has to take that duty obviously very seriously. But if, you're, if your mission statement, as they've made clear, is to eliminate Hamas completely, and Hamas live in, the, in Gaza surrounded by civilians, among civilians, you can only do that, you can only get rid of Hamas with massive civilian casualties. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. where I have this moral quandary about mm -hmm. how much is too much. Well, it, 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 does Israel get a license to do whatever it wants to eliminate Hamas, or should there be a limit? And if so, what is that limit? Well, I don't think Israel will have a license to do whatever it wants, because what will happen inevitably, and I, I think if I was an Iranian propagandist, I would be counting on this. Let's imagine that Israel moves against Hamas with its usual effectiveness. And they start winning, you know, in a serious way, and the casualties mount. Well, it's a lot easier to take a victim appreciation stance against a power that's clearly winning. So Israel can't win without accruing losses along the way, because the more they manifest their military superiority, the easier it's going to be for those who cast the Palestinians as victims to hold, to gain the moral upper hand. And so, and that doesn't mean I know what Israel should do, because I wish I had that wisdom. 
But what I would like to see happen, in the best of all possible worlds perhaps, would be for the signees of the Abraham Accords to say to Israel, privately first, we're not budging. And then maybe, and then maybe to take a foray into the public and say that, it would be lovely to see Saudi Arabia come out and say, you know, we're going to continue the Abraham Peace Accord process. And then Israel could say, well, if the Abraham Accord holds and we have the probability of expanding it, we can take the risk of not being so devastating in our response to Hamas, and they could back off, but because there'd be, there'd be a counter victory in it for them. And so as far, like, I can't see a better pathway forward than that, and I think that's a potentially realistic pathway, especially because that would also have the side benefit of not allowing Iran to prevail. So that's, as, that's the best I can do on, on how this might proceed in the, in the most optimistic possible way. And on, I don't know on, if that's good enough or not. On October the 7th, you tweeted, give them hell, Netanyahu, enough yep. is enough. And you got some blowback for that, as everybody yeah, who lot. says anything about this. Were you surprised yeah. by the scale of the blowback? Do you wish you'd phrased that tweet differently? Do you have any regrets about well, it? You know, Twitter is a very complicated social media platform, and it's been difficult for me to learn how to use it wisely. And I'm not alone in that, because it's difficult to be wise on Twitter. Now, what I'm trying to learn is when a tweet is appropriate and when a long-form commentary is appropriate. And the rule, I think, is something like the higher the stakes, the more likely that the long-form commentary is necessary. And really, it would have been better had I because I did release a YouTube video where I explained some of what we already talked yes, about. I my saw sense it, yeah. that yeah, yeah. And that was well, that was received much better, let's put it mm. that way, but it also gave me a chance to elaborate my argument. And so what it highlighted for me, and I felt, you know, I was look, I wasn't I was very taken aback by what happened in in Israel. And I was also appalled because in my estimation it was unnecessary as I said the Abraham Accords could have been extended earlier and maybe this wouldn't have been necessary um, and so I, I, I allowed myself to express some sentiment at that point without providing context and that wasn't as good as providing the context and so True. and I'm rethinking Twitter overall at the moment about how to use it. You know, Elon has taken off the character limit and he's also made it possible to distribute video and so it no longer has to be a place where impulsive exchanges can, can occur rapidly and I'm trying to reconfigure how I use it. I'm much happier with the video. Now, you know, I was upset because I had developed somewhat of a Muslim following um, on YouTube and I was very happy about that. A lot of people on the Islamic side of the world were watching my biblical lectures, for example, and, you know, and I've had extensive conversations with Muslims on my YouTube channel. And, you know, I burnt some of that up, and I'm not sure I did that, well, I, I would say I'm certain I didn't do that in the most productive manner. Hmm. And so, do I regret it? It would have been better to do the long form, to, to have done the long form to begin with, you know? And Twitter invites and rewards a certain amount of impulsivity, and it wasn't... I don't know, Pierce, I don't know if it's ever time for impulsive action, especially when the stakes are serious, you know? Guy, this was an amazing interview. It's so much to learn talking about that. And I believe that anything happening in Pakistan is, was not supposed to happen. Did I say the first time you about the Abraham Law, like it's the first time, but I feel it's. I'm gonna read on it, so I really can't say I don't know what it counts for, but I know that Christians and Muslims actually believe Abraham is their father. So I feel that is where we agree on because even if Christian and Muslims don't agree, on, don't agree on Jesus and Muhammad, but we agree on Abraham, like 
that's why the covenant started from like when you have to circumcise a child. Yes. So like we agree on it. And I see something that dates back to that time and but like this, well, I love the conversation they had and I love the way Jeremy doesn't clarify in the last part about his tweet. Give them hell for hell. Like, I feel, you know, a question was asked. Maybe I was watching an interview and they asked the woman, what do you think you're supposed to do after Hamas invaded it? And she was like, she couldn't answer the question. Like, she couldn't. It, it was hard. And it's a tough question to ask because stuff because you know like some people in Asia lost their life and I feel an eye for an eye is not supposed to be the way out to be honest like because you just cause a lot of heartbreak and hatred like people people that see their children they will want to join the Hamas to put it down like that kind of burning hatred against Israel is you know what supposed like I don't see that what Israel is how could I know? I, I, I don't feel that's what's supposed to happen. Like, it should not just be. Like, why believe that everything's going to be fine? Like, to be honest, everything is necessarily going to be fine. Guys, then we think about this video. Thank you to like, share, subscribe to my channel. I'll see you next time, guys. Bye.